So I'm going to talk to you about uh, being the commander of EORD and a couple other things today. I've had the job since uh, July of this 2011, so I am new to the job. And it's turned out to be uh, even more interesting than I thought it would be. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So I'll talk to you about what we do at EORD. I'll talk about how we think we're doing at EORD. And then the last part of the just a couple slides are something we talked about a lot last week. That is this idea of changing the international enterprise and collaborating perhaps more internationally and uh, presenting one face to OSR and the Air Force when you were going overseas. So I'll say a little bit about it. This is really for people who didn't, weren't here last week. For people who were here last week, you'll, you'll see some of the same themes. So let's go on. So EARD 101, on the books, we are one of the largest, uh, in fact, we are the largest overseas office by billets, uh, depending on how the personnel system fills it. Uh, like right now, we are very full. I think I only have about two military positions, PM positions not filled. And so we are a large office. I have uh, six program managers and a technical director, and they uh, are in these fields. Of course, when I say one program manager covers physics, uh, that very quickly gets narrowed down to things that the program manager is comfortable with and things that the Air Force is interested in. So we probably need to start working on talking about our PMs and don't just call them the PM for physics, but this is the expertise I have right now. I have a support staff there uh, of nine folks and one person who, a contracting officer as an experiment, is actually sitting here in Arlington working on EORD business, but sitting here and um, it's an experiment because we've talked about doing distributed operations, perhaps not having to put a business office in every overseas location and, and this is an experiment. So let me jump down here. So why do I need 10 people at EORD? Well, one of the reasons is we also run a base, which would be a whole other briefing about how do you run a base with 100 people where only 20 of you are the Air Force. We have the Army and Navy um, offices similarly interested in research in Europe and a bunch of others. So that takes a lot of my time. I try not to make it take a lot of my program manager's time, but if things affect me, it certainly affects my staff. And so. I'll just throw that out there. It is a reality when you're doing business at EORD. Now let me jump back up. So there is plenty of science to follow in Europe, and we've been around for 60 years. Queen Elizabeth is her Diamond Jubilee year. It's also the Diamond Jubilee year for EORD. So we're as old as OSR, uh, established in Belgium in 1952. So we've been doing this mission for a long time. So let me talk a little bit about what we're doing today and how we think we're going to be doing business in the future. Next. All right, so uh, my tech director went and did a survey. We're trying to look at data to determine how do we know how we're doing. And he went back a couple years and collected all the grants that we'd been giving out throughout Europe and compared them to a similar uh, organization with interest in science, the European Research Council. And put up the countries here. We are, we are uh, in blue. The uh, European Research Council is in brown. And if you look at the top 10, we are fairly similar, not completely matched, but fairly similar. Now, when I got the job in July, I would have said a chart like this is pretty important for knowing how we do business. Now I might uh, be so bold to say is maybe this is five or 10% of what we need to know about what we're doing in Europe. Uh, I won't, we debated this a lot last week and we'll continue to debate it, but I'll, I'll just say two things. One, uh, the European Research Council and the Air Force may have different priorities, so we may not align with what they want to fund. Uh, they might want to fund oceanographic studies in the North Sea. We won't fund that, so there will be differences. The other thing is, if there's a world-class center of excellence in Europe in, a, in an area that the European Research Council is very interested in, but there's also one in the U.S., we're not going to compete. We will, we will support the U.S. efforts, so there will be some things we'll take a pass on where other funding agencies will be all in and, and we may just be keeping an eye on it. So I wouldn't, you, you need to do this. You have to look at this information. But I don't believe this is our only management tool for knowing what we should be funding overseas. So it should be part of the discussion, but not the biggest part of the discussion. So if I don't want to talk about this, what do I want to talk about? I've, uh, I want to talk about two programs and talk about the relationships and some time it's taken to develop those. Scott Dudley, one of our, he is our most senior program manager. As he's looked back at his five years, I've, he's already interested in this and I've encouraged him to look back and say, okay, so what did you do in five years? What did you accomplish? And what are you gonna tell your replacement 
What should be their goals? What, what are the kind of things they should be trying to do when they're there for their short time at Eord? So I'm going to take you through two stories. You've heard some of these, and I'll try to highlight uh, these as exemplars of what you should do overseas when you're a program manager. Next. Okay, so number one is the story of uh, this group in Manchester that uh, works in graphene. And so there's a timeline, and uh, it, I'll point out right off the bat, so the papers in graphene were written in 2004 and 2005, before EORD was funding this group. So right off the bat, we don't say that the Air Force you know, funded graphene. We happen to fund a group that had a lot to do with graphene. And in 2008, uh, Scott Dudley shows up at EORD, and he has an interest in this area. He goes up to visit the uh, folks in Manchester and decides to give them a grant. And, and then we, we start to see all kinds of interactions. So he's there visiting their lab, then down here we start to see uh, data sharing, samples and data shared between uh, RX and uh, the group at Manchester. We start to see uh, AFRL researchers being made aware and interested in this research. We have a Windows on Science visit by one of the two uh, PIs, Kostya Novoselov, coming to Wright-Patterson to talk and engage with uh, U.S. researchers. Here's a photo opportunity. Um, Scott likes to take pictures. He happened to take pictures during the Tory convention in Manchester and the police stopped him. So that led to this photo opportunity with two Air for All scientists <laughs> and some police. Um, we go up on top here. So here's Andre Geim uh, being hosted by a joint OSR ONR conference here at, at, at our location here at uh, One Liberty Center. And I believe this was the start of a number of MURIs in graphene, and he was here to to be in the discussions for that. And then, and then I think is the most interesting thing. So in this case, uh, Dr. John Beckel comes to visit Manchester, not just for a day or a week, but comes for a couple months in this program called Windows on the World. This is a program open to anyone in AFRL who wants to come and visit a PI's lab somewhere overseas. And my understanding is that John went into grad student mode. He was working 12-hour days and uh, not just listening to talks and chatting over lunch, but was actually doing work for a number of months. Well, that must have been very interesting because then in October, they announced that these guys have won the Nobel Prize in Physics. So he, he probably had an idea that he had spent his time well that summer. And, uh, but, but this is a nice transition where, because we're overseas and, and Scott can engage with these folks and other people here at OSR also engage with the graphing group, um, I think this is a nice transition where now AFRL, the folks who are going to do the 6.2 and 6.3 work in this area, are building knowledge that could lead to whatever the decisions are going to be on graphing in the future. Uh, I'll point out, along with being acknowledged in papers that you are the funding agency, when you go to the Nobel dinner, every laureate gets 14 people to invite. So that's 28 people for two of them. So Scott was one of the invitees and the ONR PM was the other. So there are two DOD people being asked to come to Stockholm to sit in on this dinner, I, I think that's a good indication of the relationships we had with this group. And uh, that relationship continues today. Next. Two recent papers. Uh, one, an example of um, 2D layering of graphene with other materials to uh, uh, demonstrate a transistor. And the second paper, a very interesting uh, surface treatment of graphene, gives you this wonderful uh, property of being permeable to water, but impermeable to everything, including helium. So these guys continue to publish and push the boundaries in this material, and we're very happy to be part of that uh, collaboration. Next. Okay, another group. Perhaps we'd say uh, if the graphene relationship is, is more mature, this maybe is just beginning. And it's this quantum information science that uh, Scott talked a little bit about. He uses the word quantum weirdness to describe this. And I'd be happy to have him talk to you more about that. Uh, but there are people who have been interested in this area. Uh, Rome Lab RI has, has been doing work in this area since 2000. And again, we have just played a role in building relationships. Uh, starting with uh, Ian Wolmsley, who has been funded by other PMs here at Arlington. Uh, we led a grant with him in 2008. Then due to some sleuthing by uh, Space Command Chief Scientist Doug Beeson, who was here yesterday, we were uh, made known, uh, it was brought to our attention this Professor O'Brien at Bristol, which led to him visiting Rome and a Windows on Science, and we led a grant with him. 
And then the last part of this triumphant is uh, a fellow named Philip Walther at the University of Vienna, who Scott has found and is kind of bringing into this group. And so what we think we've got here is three people who, who really were getting a critical mass in this very interesting area of quantum information science that is not available in other places of the world, and, and Scott is bringing them together. Here we have the four uh, RI Rome folks. This is in front of our building there at Blenheim Crescent. Uh, we hope to have a Windows on Science visit of, of them coming to visit one of these three or maybe all three of these gentlemen in the near future. And they publish two. Next. So here's an example of uh, three publications recently. Um, Ian Walther, uh, sorry, Ian Wolmsley uh, in Science and also recent in Physical Review Letters talking about very interesting quantum effects being seen in macroscopic diamond six inches separated on a light table at room temperature. And uh, this received a lot of popular uh, press as well as scientific press. Um, the, the newest member of this group that we put, we're putting together uh, in Vienna, interesting uses of blind quantum computing, which has implications for if you want to do secure third party computing and you may not own the network and you wouldn't necessarily want everyone to know the kind of calculations you're doing. And lastly, O'Brien, who this, this work was not uh, did not come about because of a grant we let, but we have a grant with him starting, starting in January, and it's the kind of work that we, we feel will be relevant to this group. So this is, a, I think, an early relationship and one we're happy to be playing a part at in an EORD. Next. So Scott was very uh, excited about doing this work, so he started looking at, at uh, papers in science. He picked two months. You might say he picked two pretty good months. He picked December 11 and January 12th. Uh, what he could find is seven papers cited Air Force uh, support for their papers uh, in those two months. And it turned out that three of them came from international programs. So I would argue this might be more of a valuable metric to determine whether we are doing good work overseas rather than how our money is distributed. And, uh, and we'll continue to keep tabs on this kind of information. So we're happy to be playing a part in this. So, Next. So, so what are we doing? Uh, in summary, we try to go find good science, but good science isn't enough because if it's just duplicating something in the U.S., that's not interesting to us. We have to, we have to collaborate and, and augment things that are being done here. Anyone who is in the Air Force and wants to be overseas and wants help, we have to play a role in that, try to build relationships, and we're happy to do that. But, uh, and, and Dr. Russell has asked us, and, and asked us quite strongly, so what, what can you be doing better? So if good science is not enough and I don't have enough money or time to fund all the good science, that means I have to pick and prioritize. So what is the mechanism to do that? Uh, right now it's done by smart program managers making smart decisions and that's pretty good, but I, I think we can do a little better job, uh, particularly in why all the international PMs are sitting here all week because they need to see what is being done in Arlington and help fill those gaps. So what are the realistic timelines? How long do we stay with this graphene group in Manchester? I don't know. Uh, has anyone talked about what is our timeline? When do we get out? We don't have enough money to you know, fully fund groups for decades overseas. We, we're going to have a slightly different take on things. We're going to want to get in and get out. So when do we get out? When do we get in? We believe it's more important to be in at the beginning. When you can have discussions with PIs as they're you know, first wrestling with these concepts, that's a little better than waiting for the big paper to come out and then come visit with money and try to catch up. In the case of Scott Dudley, uh, he's, he's leaving this summer. So how do we as OSR decide how to pick up parts of that program? Obviously, I have a physicist coming for the Air Force Academy who will try to pick up some of that, but it may be that someone here at OSR needs to pick up some of that. So we need to talk about it. And finally, um, I'm told that being overseas is very important to our relationship with the Brits. I'd like to talk more about that, what exactly that means. We, we don't just spend money to make friends. I know that is a side benefit, but I'd like to talk specifically about what that means and how are we supposed to be doing work overseas. So, uh, Mark Maurice talked about it yesterday. Research overseas as a proportion of what's done on this planet is growing. Our budget is either neutral or shrinking, so we need to make sure we're doing a smart job using this uh, and providing support to the OSR team. So, next. So, after 60 years, there's some changes in the works. 
And uh, I, I, I should say, in fairness, after 60 years, the title should say, after 60 years, more changes, because things have changed in 60 years. But the big thing is the creation of this green box here. The, the regional offices, Tokyo, London, and Santiago, will remain. We'll still continue to have a presence overseas. But now we've created this International Science Office. And the point of creating this office is to make one belly button for what is our strategy overseas, how do we do business overseas, how do we move people overseas. And currently, if you want to have that discussion, you have to talk to four different offices. Now you only talk to one. And I'll add right now, the only person populating this office right now is me. Uh, I am the International Science Office, and I'm, I'm happy to have any inputs that, and I've been getting some already, uh, because we're wrestling on a very short time frame with what's the best way to do this. So we'll have one belly button. We're going to soften the barriers overseas. I think this has already been done. No one has ever said to someone at the Tokyo office, no, you can't do anything in Europe. But I think we're going to talk about opening that up even more. Um, we might not need an aero PM in every office. Uh, we might need an aero PM or a chemistry PM in one office, and they might be in to help run programs internationally. It's probably a benefit for a PM to say, when you come to London, just worry about Europe because there's so much to cover, but we're going to ask them to think a little more broadly and globally. We will keep the overseas presence. Uh, it comes at a cost. It does cost money to keep us there, but I think we can show value. At the same time, we're, we're looking very hard at how do we, because we all do a lot of the same things, grants and conferences, how do we get that money to people overseas? Maybe we need to consolidate business, and uh, the boss has is, is asked us to look to that. We, need, we don't want to be in, there's no international strategy. We have an international component to your OSR strategy. So to do that, we're going to have to do a lot of talking. Uh, I, sorry, I have the wrong nomenclature here. At one point, it was called the Chief Technology Officer, and now I think it's called the Basic Science Officer. I will have to be doing a lot of talking to this person, because what are those OSR priorities? Uh, I mean, everybody in this room is going to help create these priorities. The PMs who have been building programs for years will have a lot of insight as to what we should be doing. It will be my job to answer and say, when I'm spending money overseas, how do I fit into an OSR strategy? People in the directorates, uh, people here, but people in the directorates like to be overseas. They like to get people into the, the London office. Well, I, I, I'm happy to have people in the London office, but I'm also going to want to talk to you about, have, have you got Asia covered too? And have you got the South American office covered? So I, I'm going to give you a global answer, not just, I'm at EOR and I'm happy to have more program managers. Finally, the, you can save a lot of money by just closing up this place. Um, actually, you wouldn't save that much money, and you'd be taking a big risk. So this is not just about saving money. This is about doing the job that we think is valuable and a very small fraction of, of OSR's budget and showing some real value. So that is the, uh, the endeavor we're on. If you ask me a timeline, I'd say in the next couple months we're going to be making a lot of decisions uh, as to how we're going to operate. I would say in 13, a lot of how we're going to be doing new things will be driven by this new strategy. And that's our timeline. We're not going to be talking about this for years. Uh, I leave in 2014, so I, I, have a, I have a short fuse as to what we're going to do. But when we do it, we want it to be something that is sustainable. So uh, with that, I will give you a minute and 40 for questions.